Okay, welcome back uh, after the break. Uh, there's a quest question from Getrude. Do these churches still exist? Yes. You know, the churches do exist. It's a work of God and cannot die. You know, it just doesn't happen in a period of revival. It grows, it moves, and yes, there are churches still there. Yeah. But those churches would have grown, multiplied. Yes, and they would have had many other churches. Yes. Any other question? Deepu, you have your hand raised up. You have a question? Okay. Uh, so we'll, we'll continue. So Paul is now where? Which place? Huh? Ephesus? Where is he now? Where is Paul? No, he's not yet gone to Jerusalem. <laughs> he's in Miletus. Can you see Miletus in your map? Yes, he's in Miletus. And then, uh, you know, um, uh, he's from Miletus, he's alive to Caesarea. Okay. And at Caesarea, we, we ended there. Okay. So we saw that at Caesarea, he visited the home of Philippi. Uh, Philip, sorry, not Philippi. Philip the Evangelist. You know Philip the Evangelist, right? When the persecution broke out, he went to which place? Ephesus. Everything Ephesus. He went to which place? Samaria. Acts chapter 8. Okay. He went to Samaria and um, we see that uh, he's um, now uh, he meets uh, Philip there, Philip the Evangelist. And also at that time, uh, this prophet called Agabus comes from Judea, okay? He comes from Judea to do what? To warn Paul what is going to happen in Jerusalem, okay? Like what the Holy Spirit tells him. So can somebody please read Acts chapter 21, verses 10 to 16. We'll see what the Holy Spirit is warning Paul. Acts 21, 10 to 16. And yes. as we stayed... Many days a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to a U.S., he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now, when we heard these things, both we and those from the from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be pursued, we ceased saying, The will of the Lord be done. Amen. Okay. So what is Agabus, uh, the prophet, telling Paul not to go to Jerusalem? But do you think Paul was, uh, want, wanted to go to Jerusalem? Did Paul want to go to Jerusalem? Yes. He wanted to go there before Pentecost. And why does he want to go to Jerusalem? To get the offerings, yes, that they had collected. He wanted to give the offerings. Now, when, um, you know, when some of the people tell Paul not to go to Jerusalem, and the prophet Agabus is very plainly telling this, the Holy Spirit is telling me, do you think Paul still goes to Jerusalem? Yes. Why do you think he still goes? Look at what... Uh, 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 he says in we we read verse fifteen, right? Fifteen and sixteen. After this, we uh, you didn't read. Mm -hmm. Can you till where did you read? Uh, and after those days, we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Also, some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a, a, a certain mansion of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the, the brethren received us gladly. On the following day, Paul ah, went. Okay. Okay. So thank you. Um, so here we see that, you know, they, 
uh, the believers there at Caesarea plead with Paul, verse 12, not to go to Jerusalem. But Paul, what does he say? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay. Uh, now, why do you think when Agabus is telling, the Holy Spirit is telling me, okay, and the people are telling not to go, why, irrespective of that, why does Paul still go to Jerusalem? Agabus was a prophet, right? And he says, this is what the Holy Spirit told me. This is what the Holy Spirit showed me. Right? Okay, he was not concerned about his own life, okay? Huh? He did his own will, okay? Look at what Agabus says. Does Agabus say the Holy Spirit asks you not to go to Jerusalem? Okay. In this way, Yeah, that is all he says. But does the Holy Spirit say not to go to Jerusalem? Okay, I'm just I'm just looking at it with you know with my human logic and perspective and trying to see did Paul really disobey the Holy Spirit? He's not somebody who does it, but here there is no clear evidence that you know the Holy Spirit is telling him not to go. But the Holy Spirit is telling him what will happen to him. But also with my human understanding, trying to look at what scripture is telling us, look at what Paul says when we read in, um, you know, Acts chapter 20, verses uh, 2 to 38. Look at what it says in Acts chapter 20, verse 22. What does Paul write? What, what does Paul say when he's speaking to the Ephesus leaders who had come to Miletus? What does he tell them? And see... Now I go bound in the spirit. You have to use the my. Oh, sorry, yeah. Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there. So what is Paul saying now? Compelled by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is compelling him to do what? Go to Jerusalem. So he's saying I'm compelled by the Holy Spirit, and hence I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. So he doesn't know what is going to happen to him there but look at what God is doing God is so merciful and good he's telling him what is going to happen to him at Jerusalem through the prophet Agabus now I'm just looking at scripture with my human understanding trying to understand and reason okay and also look at what Paul says in verse 23 we already read that but you can read it again once again please except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city saying that chains and tribulation Revelations await me, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself. Yes, so he says, I know that in every city the Holy Spirit is warning me that prison and hardships are facing me. But we can ask this question, why did Paul go to Jerusalem? Why did he unnecessarily get into all that trouble when he was already warned? But here he was warned about what is going to happen to him. But he also says that he was compelled in the spirit to go to Jerusalem. So I think if he was not compelled in his spirit, he wouldn't have gone to Jerusalem. He would have heeded the Holy Spirit. But we do not know. We are just reading from what we are reading in Scripture and trying to analyze and try to um, see. Okay. So this is my uh, kind of reasoning when I was preparing I was looking at it and I was trying to reason look at scripture this is what I found if you find something else you can always uh, share it okay can you please use the mic so in line in, with what you're saying mm -hmm. it also complements with verse 14 where uh, these uh, disciples finally give up and they say Lord's will be done mm -hmm. so eventually you can imply that it was Lord's will for him to any which ways go to they would have just said like humanly, you know, that lots will be done, whatever happens to uh, you. Okay. Um, later on also we see Paul, you know, when he's traveling, um, God tells him, you know, I will, you will, you will speak to kings and uh, people in 
authority. And that we see being fulfilled when he was in, imprisoned in Caesarea for two years and also in um, Rome. Okay. Uh, the desire to, to meet Romans. Yes, he had a great desire to, to meet the believers at Rome because he had heard about their persecution and their faith was so strong in the, their persecution. But um, yeah, he desired to go to Rome, but he did not desire to go as a prisoner. But eventually he went to Rome as a prisoner. But we see in spite of that, God still opened up the doors for him to um, minister there. Okay. So here we're saying, uh, why did Paul go to uh, Jerusalem? Okay. Okay. So you're saying maybe he went to Jerusalem so that he could go to uh, Rome. Okay. So we see that, you know, um, uh, any questions anyone has regarding this? Okay. No questions. Okay. So we see that the, he, uh, you know, they all, uh, Paul prays for them. They all, uh, you know, cry and then Paul leaves and then he goes up to Jerusalem. Okay, so he, they go up to Jerusalem in the spring of AD 58 and they're received gladly by the believers there. And Paul again visits the temple. Um, and uh, you know, he's he's hearing that you know the Jews will again cause a lot of problem for him. So he says that he and the four Jewish converts, you know, since they'll have to enter the temple, they he said, let us do some. Uh, Jewish purification rites so that there will be no problem, there will be no uproar, there will be, you know, uh, everything will be peaceful. Paul actually, if you see, uh, if you ask the question, hey, why did Paul have to go to, he went to Jerusalem, he knows things are going to happen, okay, he's going to be persecuted and all of those things. Why didn't he just give the money and quietly go away, okay? Maybe he wanted to minister there, okay? Or maybe he wanted to do, uh, you know, speak to the Jews, whatever it is. So he finds a way out and he does this purification rite with four other Jewish converts. And at the end of the seven days, when those purification rites were over, they go to the to the temple, they have to all make an offering. And that is when some of the Jews in the province of Asia see Paul and they stir up a crowd. They say that this you know, man has brought Gentiles into the temple and has defiled the temple. Okay. So there was a big problem there. It was basically, they are referring to Trophimus, uh, who was in Ephesus, the city of Ephesus. They assumed that Paul brought Trophimus to the temple, but Paul did not. Trophimus was a, a Gentile or a Greek. Okay. So the whole city was aroused. They uh, were very angry with Paul. They took him, they dragged him from the temple and, you know, they, they tried to kill him. And when the uh, Roman commander heard about it, the Roman troops came, they, you know, um, um, asked the, the crowd to, to leave, the rioters saw the, the commanding officer and the soldiers coming, they stopped beating Paul, then, you know, they, the commanding officer and the soldiers, they seized Paul, and they took him outside the temple, okay, um, and um, we see that, you know, Paul asked for time to speak to the Jews. We don't know what whether he should have done that or not, but you see that even in that such situation of persecution, and he knows that he is going to be killed, he uses that time to minister to the Jews. Okay, so he took takes the opportunity to share about his encounter which he had with Jesus, and all the mob, all the crowd were listening very intently to Paul till the point. And this we read in Acts chapter 22, verses 1 to 30. They listened to him very carefully till he said in verse 21 of chapter 22, then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. When they heard this, the Jews were very, very angry, you know. And um, uh, when the, the people got angry, the commanding officer thought, you know, things are going to get out of hand. He took Paul and he commanded his... Um, you know, his soldiers to flog him, okay? Now, flogging is a very serious uh, punishment, is something that they will be beaten, scourged, whipped very badly. So how did Paul, look at Paul's presence of mind, even in the situation, you see how the Holy Spirit is ministering to Paul. So when he's going to be flogged, you see how smartly Paul uses his wisdom or even the what the Holy Spirit would have given to him. Paul says, hey, I'm a Roman, 
citizen. So he plays his Roman citizenship card, okay? He says, I'm a Roman citizen, and you haven't even tried me. And without trying a Roman citizen and proving him guilty of some punishment, you cannot flog him. So these soldiers got scared. They went and told the commanding officer, and the commanding officer was shocked that Paul was a Roman citizen. And then he just puts him in the prison, okay? And uh, Paul's sister's son hears the Jews are planning to kill Paul when they bring him out for trial. And so he, Paul tells uh, his um, nephew, tell him, tells him, go tell, um, uh, you know, um, uh, the commanding officer, he goes and tells the commanding officer, the commanding officer immediately arranges Paul to be with great security of guards that, that very night to take him away to Caesarea. Okay, uh, and, and in Caesarea, he was brought before the governor um, Felix and the governor Fetus and King Agrippa. Okay, and so there he is for two whole years. And in this two years, this this governor Felix is very interested to hear about the gospel. So he keeps on calling Paul. But when Paul is talking about righteousness and holiness, and he's somebody who's living in deep sin, he is not willing to accept the gospel. And why do you think they kept Paul for two whole years? Is because maybe this governor Felix, uh, you know, scholars say he was a very greedy man. He was a very, uh, you know, uh, a man looking for money and uh, uh, position. So he was looking for bribe that his disciples will come and bribe them to, to you know, uh, release Paul, but none of them bribes him. So Paul stays there for two years. And, you know, these uh, three people, the governors, Felix, Fetus, and Agrippa, you know, they were uh, they were playing uh, politics between the Jews and the Romans. Okay, just to please the Jews, they kept Paul. And, and but, you know, Paul used this time to, you know, speak the gospel to the uh, to these men, and many of them in uh, listened, or many of the soldiers also listened to the uh, gospel. Okay, so we see that it was uh, political leaders in Caesarea and Judea uh, that you know that Paul preached the gospel. So no time that Paul wastes, or no opportunity Paul wastes to share the uh, gospel. And then when he is brought before Agrippa, you know Paul, you know he appeals to. Caesar. Now, why do you think Paul appeals to Caesar? People say you shouldn't have appealed to Caesar. You know, anyway, Agrippa would have set him free. What do you think? Did Paul do the right thing? Because of which he was taken from Caesarea to Rome. We're saying that Agrippa was almost going to release him, but if, or, you know, these governors were going to release Paul, uh, Paul but if he had not you know, appeal to Caesar. What do you think? Yes. Yeah. Can you please speak that in the mic? It says in uh, chapter 23, verse 11, where Jesus appears to Paul and says, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Yes. So we see that Paul, you know, many people say Paul did a foolish thing by going to Jerusalem. But we see here how the Holy Spirit is leading him, what God is telling him. He says, you know, Jesus tells him, take courage. You have testified about me in Jerusalem. You must also testify me about in Rome. And Paul also remember what he says in, um, um, you know, he says, uh, God tells him that you will preach about me before, before kings and rulers and those in authority and we see that being um, fulfilled okay so um you think it was right for him to appeal to caesar yes maybe because even what god had told him also paul knew that he's not going to be set free he know he knows that these three men these two governors and this king agrippa very wicked men they are playing cards they're playing games okay they will quietly release him off to the jews and they will take heavy money from them. And the Jews would be willing to pay any amount to kill and get done with Paul. So Paul knew that there was a threat to his life. So he thought, let me appeal to Caesar. Okay. And so he appeals to Caesar. And then we see that Paul is taken away to where does he go? From Caesarea to where does he go? Where does Caesar? Rome. Rome. Yes. 
he goes to Rome. So can you put that next map, please? Um, can you broaden it? So we see that um, from Caesarea, we're not going to look at Paul's journey. Uh, details of Paul's journey from uh, Caesarea to Rome is given in Acts chapter 27, verses one, chapter one, verse 1 to chapter 28, verse 15. So if you look at that red line, those are the places that they all travel right up to Rome. Okay, And you know the difficulty they had in the journey. Okay, But we see that when Paul goes to traveling to uh, Rome, who travels along with him? Luke. Okay. Uh, we see Luke went with him to Jerusalem and the end of his third missionary journey. And when Paul was arrested in Jerusalem and imprisoned in Caesarea, he was there. Okay. Uh, and we see that uh, 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 Dr. Luke writes the book of Acts. Okay. Uh, so when Paul appeals to Caesar, he sets sail to Rome. And we see that uh, Luke and Aristarchus also went with. Paul, Acts chapter 27, verse uh, 2. So if you want to look at Paul's journey you know, from Caesarea to Rome, you can look at the map that is given there. Okay, um, And so when he reaches Rome, the disciples there, or the believers there are very excited. Before he even reaches Rome, you know, they come to meet him and they're very excited. And uh, uh, Paul is in house arrest at Rome, which gives him the freedom to meet people. And we see that even when he was in his Roman imprisonment, he does not waste any time to minister the gospel. So he's somebody who preaches in season and out of season. Okay, sometimes we think, hey, I'm going to a bad season in life. I don't think I should be preaching, teaching, God will not use me. But we look at Paul here, you know, any season of life, he's there ministering and preaching and teaching and God is, the Holy Spirit is working so powerfully. So when he's uh, imprisoned in Rome, he's, he writes the letter to the church at Colossae. He's writing, he's written Colossians, Philemon, Ephesians and Philippians, okay. So Paul, uh, why does he write to the church at Colossae? Because he, um, you know, he meets the um, Onesimus, and uh, you know, um, um, Epaphras is also there. Come to Rome, so he sends a letter to the church at Colossae. Uh, that's why he write Colossians, and also he meets Onesimus, the runaway slave of Philemon. So he's sending Onesimus back. So he writes the letter to Philemon. Okay, and we see that uh, Paul also um, writes uh, the letter to the church at Ephesus and the church at uh, uh, Philippi. Okay, that is Philippians, he writes there. And we see during this time also that, you know, uh, many guards who are overseeing Paul, Paul even ministers to the guards, and these high ranking guards in turn take the gospel to, into the Roman palace. So you see how the word of God is spreading. Paul is just speaking to the guards there and these guards take the gospel, go back home, minister and also is taken into the Roman palace. Okay, So we see that he um, also meets the Jews. He calls the Jews at Rome, tries to explain his stand to them and that is what we read in Acts chapter 28 verses 23 to um, 30. Okay, so let's uh, just look at that quickly. Can somebody read Acts chapter 28, verses 23 to 30, please? Shall I, sister? Yeah, sure, Lucy. 20, pardon? Uh, chapter, chapter 28, 20. verses 23 to 30. Yes, sister. <clears throat> so when they had appointed him. A day many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. And some were persuaded by the things which were spoken, and some disbelieved. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word, the Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers saying, Go to these people and say, Hearing you will hear, and shall not understand, and seeing you will see, and not perceive. For the eyes of these people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes have they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, 
least they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles and they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had a great dispute among themselves. Then Paul dwelt whole two years in his own rented house and received all who came to him. Amen. Can you please read verse uh, 31 as well? Yes, sister. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. Amen. Amen. So here we see, uh, you know, Paul is speaking to the Jews. He's telling them, you know, uh, why he's, what he's doing, what, why he's doing what he's doing, why he's ministering to the Jews, why he's ministering to the Gentiles. And, you know, he's a scholar in the Old Testament. So he's speaking from Old Testament because the Jews understand the Old Testament uh, better. And then he says, because you have refused to listen to the gospel, God is taking the gospel of the salvation to the Gentiles and they were not happy with this. Some believed, some did not believe. There's a big, big dispute, a big argument among themselves. But we see that for two whole years, when Paul was in Roman imprisonment, what does he do? He's teaching and preaching about what? Yes, he's proclaiming the kingdom of God and he teaches them about Jesus Christ. And look at what how how he's doing it. He's doing it with all. He's doing it at all. What does it say? Look at verse 31. What does verse 31 say? Yes, he's doing that with all boldness, with confidence, and without any hindrance. Okay. So we see that how God is using this man in revival to birth revival anywhere and everywhere, whether it's about in front of governors, uh, crowds, mobs, Jews, synagogue, uh, guards, in, in, uh, in uh, imprisonment, wherever God is just using him to spread that revival fire. And this is what happens during revival. When revival happens, you know, God will just burn the revival fire anywhere and everywhere, and it will just move very, very um, mightily. Okay, so we see that um, Paul's desire to reach Rome finally was fulfilled, but not in the way that he wanted, like a free man. But he was as a, uh, you know, as a, a prisoner. Yes. Okay, and uh, he was there for two whole years, but he ministered so uh, powerfully. Okay, um, then you know um, we see that. Look at Paul's final years, page number 24, going on to page number uh, 25. So following his uh, release from his uh, first imprisonment, he and Titus worked briefly in the island of Crete. And, you know, Paul left uh, Titus in the island of Crete um, to continue uh, the, the work there. Okay, and um, it's possible that Paul would have traveled with Timothy to Ephesus at this time. And then because there was a need of, uh, for an overseer, somebody to look after the work there, even though there were elders and overseers and leaders that he had appointed at Ephesus. Remember third missionary journey, he appointed elders there and he also met them at Miletus, yes. But there was a lot of problems. There was something that work needed to be done so he leaves Timothy to carry on the work there and then Paul goes on to Macedonia and from Macedonia he writes a letter to Timothy to encourage him he writes Titus to encourage Titus and also if uh, you know uh, if uh, if uh, we agree that Paul is the one who is the author of the uh, the uh, the book of Hebrews he would have written Hebrews during this time most likely from um, Macedonia okay and um, also we see that after his release, you know, he, he desired to travel to Spain. Remember, he says, I want to go to Jerusalem. From Jerusalem, I want to go to Rome. From Rome, he wants to go to uh, Spain. So they're saying that most likely he would have gone to uh, Spain, but we are not sure. Okay. So, um, but we know that after that, Paul was again arrested and taken to Rome, okay. This was his second Roman imprisonment, and this was his last days after which he was martyred. That was AD 67 to AD 63. 
Okay, so when he returned back to uh, to Rome as a Roman prisoner, you know, he writes the uh, the last epistle of Second Timothy again, writing to Timothy and encouraging him. And he knows this will be his last uh, letter. He knows that death is impending upon him and imminent uh, uh, on him. And so he writes his final words to his son on the faith, that is Timothy. And he wants Timothy to come to uh, meet him. Okay. And then we read that, you know, Paul was martyred about AD 66 to AD 68. And according to tradition, they say that he was beheaded. Um, as he was a Roman uh, citizen, it's likely he was not dealt in any other manner. Okay. So, sorry. Uh, it's not given in any book here. Okay, so uh, he writes um, Second Timothy. If you want to read, you can read Second Timothy chapter four, verses six to twenty-two. Uh, you know his last words to um, his son in the faith, Timothy, and then after that, tradition says that he was uh, beheaded. Okay. Um, anyone would like to read Second Timothy chapter four, verses six to twenty-two? Any online students? It's there can on. I read, sister. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 22, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of any departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Uh, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will that day and not to me that day and not to me only but also to all who have loved his appearing be diligent to come to me quickly for demas uh, has forsaken me having loved his present world and has departed for thessalonica galatia titus for dalmatia only luke is with me get mark and bring him with you for he is useful to me for ministry and tychicus i have sent to ephesus Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our word. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I have delivered out of the mouth of the lions and, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Monsi Forus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, but uh, Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. Do your utmost to come before winter. Uh, Eubulus greets you and well as Pudens, Linus, Claudia and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Amen. So here we see Paul's last words. He says, I've been poured out as a drink offering. My departure has come, uh, is at hand. Okay. And then look at his beautiful statement that he makes. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I have kept the faith. faith. Okay. So wonderful. And there is there for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge has given to me and also see what he says that nobody was there with him during his first dis defense everyone forsook him but who stood with him who stood with him during his first defense the lord jesus christ verse 17 and strengthened him and uh, so that the message might be preached fully through me uh, and that all gentiles might hear so we see that even when this situation we, we can ask this question, was it right for Paul to go to Jerusalem or not? We saw that. But we see that the Lord Jesus was with him 
preserved him from every evil work from he says you know preserve me from the mouth delivered me from the mouth of the lions strengthen me so that i can preach the gospel okay and um, uh, we see that um, you know finally um, he writes and he says you know some of the things that he wanted uh, young Timothy to do, and he wanted to see Timothy. Okay, so those these were his last words, but so powerful the words were how God stayed with him, the Lord Jesus stayed with him, counseled him, strengthened him during this time, and also delivered him from the mouth of the lion so that the word can be preached fully. Okay, so we see when a person is birthing revival or in the move of revival, it's not going to be very, very easy there's going to be hardships there's going to be difficulties there's going to be a lot of persecution there's going to be a lot of hard work and labor okay what does paul say the grace of god has been given i am who i am because of the grace of god that is given to me but i have labored more than all of these so he's saying hey i've been called as an apostle and i've been called as an apostle because of the grace of god but he's saying, even though the grace of God is upon me, I have labored more than all of the other people who have labored with me. That means, you know, when we are birthing revival or we want a revival or we are asking for revival, it's going to be hard labor. It's going to be hard work. Okay. And we need to be full in and given to what God is. We are asking God to birth through us and what God is doing through us. Okay. So uh, just a summary of uh, Paul uh, as a carrier of the move of God or birthing the revival. So just a few points we'll see there and then we'll end. We see that Paul ministered to about, uh, you know, about 20 to 24 years. Okay, he ministered 20 or 24 years. He did ministry, uh, 20 to 24 years of ministry that he did. And he covered almost 49 cities and towns in Asia Minor and Europe. And he traveled over 10,000 miles by land and by sea. Okay, And we know travel was not very, very easy in those days. But look at the, the work and the desire and the passion that one man had to birth revival or take the word of God to all the cities and towns um, in Asia Minor and Europe. We see that he also established various local churches who experienced the same work of the Holy Spirit, the same fire, okay, and um, we, uh, he mentions 24 people as his fellow workers, that means 24 people who is raised up in his ministry, who did great work. But we also see that in a church in revival, there will be many people who will give up, who will go away from their faith, right? When Paul is writing to Tim Timothy, in 2 Timothy, he says, Demas has left, left me and so has Alexander, right? So they've gone away from the faith. They have taken on to worldly ways. So during uh, revival, there will be many people who would also go away from the faith. Those who have come to the faith will also go away. Okay, or Those who are established in the word of God, the truth, will also fall away from the truth. Okay, And so we see that the same revival fire that was birthed in Jerusalem was also carried on to various cities and towns in Asia Minor and Europe. Okay. Um, and we see that Paul was able to minister both to the intellectuals and to the simple folks. He writes in Romans chapter 1 verse 14, I'm a debtor both to the Greek and to the barbarians. Greek means the intellectuals, the learned, the barbarians means more who are the uneducated people, okay, both to the wise and to the Unwise. So he ministered to all kinds of people, and God can also use us to minister and to birth revivals to all people from all strata of society. Okay. We also see that Paul impacted many cities, and in the cities, he not only ministered in the synagogues, but in the marketplace, in the high places, in the learned places, also in the uh, palaces that he ministered to, and in the prison as well. And during this time of his ministry, he wrote 13 uh, letters to strengthen the churches. If we include Hebrews as well, it will be 14. Okay, So we see that how 
God could use one man, right, to do such a vast, yes, amen to that, such a vast area of ministry, such great work, okay, in such a powerful way. And um, can God do this in our time and age as well? Yes, we, he can do it because he's now in a, in, a, in a time, we are all in a time where he's accelerating things, he's moving things, and we need to, if you're ready to be a Paul, you can tell God, and you know what it takes, right? That is why we did this whole study, okay? So even as we've done the study, we've seen a church in revival from Jerusalem, how it moved. We've seen people who, Stephen and Philip and all the others, um, you know, um, uh, Timothy and Titus and Paul and everyone who spread this revival fire, the apostles as well. So we can also welcome an outpouring of God. We can also say, God, we need an outpouring. Just like there was an outpouring on the day of Pentecost, we also need an outpouring of your spirit. And even as we ask that, we can ask God to prepare us to be a community of people who are saturated for God. Who, you know, revival breaks out only when people are very, very intimate, desiring for more of God. Okay. And um, we can pray that the revival fire can spread throughout our city and our nation, the nations of this world. Okay. So let's pray that, that you know, God, we will become carriers of the revival fire or we will be carriers of revival, birthing revival uh, that can influence communities and um, uh, cities and nations through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Any questions based on what we studied so far? Uh, uh, yeah, by, by all means, for what we've studied about Paul and this missionary journey, by all means, can we conclude that he's one of the greatest, <clears throat> by all means that we have studied this missionary trip and thing, you can conclude easily that, you know, Paul was one of the greatest missionary in forms of extensive travel geographically and the lives and the... Uh, yes, the we can say that he was a great uh, missionary, a great apostle. Yes, because of the extensive work that he has done, the number of churches that he has pioneered, he has churches that he strengthened, the leaders that he has uh, built up and the... The, the the revelation that he has, you know, he's given to us. Most of the New Testament is what was written by Paul. Yes. Any other questions? No questions? Uh, Ma'am. Yes. Wanted to know about the book of Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Some scholars still say that it's not written by or there is not Paul, and some say it's Paul. So just uh, how can we confirm that? Uh, some people say that it is written by Paul because of the style of writing, you know, um, because in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the book of Hebrews, there's a lot of uh, references uh, given to the priesthood that, and the sacrifices and everything that was done in the Old Testament. So they are saying most likely it would have been Paul who's written it because he was so, uh, you know, knowledgeable and trained in the Torah and the Old Testament law. So he's written it with that perspective of knowing the Old Testament law and also receiving the revelations and knowing and encountering um, Jesus Christ. So it's most probably Paul, but it's not an established fact. Yes. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, Deeksha's question is, as Paul made his own choice going for Jerusalem, that means if we are making our own choice of fulfilling our own will, God will still be in support. I don't, I don't, I can't say that Paul made his own choice because if I see from scripture, like I showed you, like two or three references, right? I showed you. It was not his own choice. He felt compelled in his spirit to go to the to Jerusalem. He also God to, told him that you've spoken now, made me known in Jerusalem. You'll also make me known in um, Rome. So we see that I don't think it is something that he did on his own will, but I really can't say. Uh, this is what I see from scripture, and this is what I infer and come to a conclusion. But um, if you're making our own choice of fulfilling our own will, can God still be in our support? Uh, no, not really. From what we have seen in scripture, that principle doesn't work. 
right? When we've gone to do our own will, you know, uh, we don't. But God can, irrespective of that, establish his own uh, plan and his purposes that he wants to birth. Okay, that he can do. But I don't think here, according to me, I don't think Paul did his own will by going to Jerusalem. Yes, we saw that Holy Spirit was warning him. Warning him, does the Holy Spirit warn him not to go to Jerusalem? The Holy Spirit is warning him and telling him what would happen in Jerusalem. But if you had listened to that verse which I read, oh, sorry. If, I lis if you had listened to the verse that I read, what's happening? One minute. Yeah. Uh, the verse that I read in, um, this is what I'm inferring from scripture, okay? Verse 22 and 23 of Acts chapter 20, it says that, now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. So he's saying that he doesn't know what will happen to him there. But later on, Agabus comes and prophesies and tells him what would happen to him in Jerusalem. Okay. So for me, I'm inferring this way. But I don't know, knowing Paul, that he would not do anything that is against God's will, I don't know. You can always come to your own conclusion about that, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, I hope you all uh, enjoyed studying uh, chapter one. It was not boring for you all, <laughs> though it was a lot of places and everything. It was quite an interesting study. I enjoyed preparing it and it was a good learning for me as well. I hope it's a good learning for all of you. Yes. Thank you, Gertrude. Thank you, Lucy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A little bit about Paul's life, I want to know about his married life and he just... Uh, Paul was not married. Not married. Yeah. Was not married. He just spent his entire life uh, uh, preaching the gospel and serving. But some says, like uh, in synagogues, at his uh, place, if uh, people has to be member of the his synagogues where he was before the, uh, then, then then he has that person has to be married. Like oh, when when people have to go into the synagogue, they have to be married. Like in where he was means before he was working for uh, the. No, I don't think so because when Jesus went to the synagogue and took the scroll and read it out, he was. Jesus was not married, right? Um, like uh, huh. to, to be the member of the synagogues. To be the member of the synagogue, you have to be married. I Sorry, I don't I don't know about that. In those days, I don't I don't uh, know that. Maybe I can we can look it up. Yeah, I don't think so. But I think if you want to speak or teach in the synagogue, you don't have to be married because Paul did. He was allowed to. And also that uh, Jesus did. And they were both not married. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you everyone for joining class. We'll end class here if no one has any questions. And we'll meet uh, next week. Thank you everybody. Have a good day.